Hello everyone. In today's lecture video, we will be discussing chapter 12, some lessons from capital market history. So up to this point, we have been taking cash flows in the future and discounting them back to a present value at a required rate of return. And we've used this in stock valuation, bond valuation, capital budgeting valuation. But what really goes into this required rate of return? So what we will be discussing in this chapter is this relationship between risk versus return. And in particular, in this chapter, we will first discuss what capital market history can tell us about this relationship between risk and return. Now, before we get into our discussion here today, the first thing that I want you to do is make sure that your calculator is set in six decimal places. So to do so, you are going to hit the second button and then format, which is the decimal on your calculators hit the number six and then hit enter. This will then transfer your calculator into six decimal places. Additionally, as you go through the ebook for this chapter, be sure to evaluate the chat or the uh, tables uh, that are presented for the year over year returns as you will have some questions that uh, go over these tables. So going into our material here for chapter 12, our learning objectives. First, know how to calculate the return on an investment. Understand the historical returns on various important types of investments. Understand the historical risks on various important types of investments. And lastly, understand the implications of market efficiency. So as we begin here today, we will first be going into risk, return, and financial markets. So we can examine the returns in financial markets to help us determine the appropriate returns on non-financial assets. So what we are going to be doing is looking at returns and taking these returns and applying them to non-financial assets such as your capital budgeting projects that we evaluated in the last, in the last chapter. Um, so at a minimum... We need to at least know what the returns are that we can get on financial assets of similar risk and then try to apply this and, and use these on these non-financial uh, projects when we are doing our analysis. So there are two lessons primarily that can be learned from capital market history. In capital markets, I'm talking about you know, stock exchanges, bond markets, so where these financial securities are being traded. So the first lesson is that there is a reward for bearing risk. And the second lesson is the greater the potential of the reward, the greater the risk. This is called the risk return trade-off. So what you should expect is that as you take on more risk in your investments, you should be compensated with a higher return. So risk and return go hand in hand. So the first thing that we will discuss is how to calculate returns. The first type of return is a dollar return. So a dollar return can be broken down into Income that is received from the investment, so it could be dividends if you're looking at stocks, it could be uh, coupon payments if you're looking at bonds, but what income did you receive on the investment? And then any capital gain or capital loss due to a price and change. So that is the change in the value of the underlying asset or the underlying security. So we still consider the capital gain or the loss even if we do not actually sell the security. We are looking at a total dollar return on a per year basis here. So example number one, you buy a bond for $950 one year ago, you have received two coupons of $30 each, so semi-annual coupon payments in this scenario, and then we sell the bond for $975 today. What is your total dollar return? So the first thing is to calculate the income from the investment. The income in this case is a coupon payment, and we received two of those, so your income total is $60. And then the capital gain or the loss is the change in the value or the price, in this case of a bond, going from 950 to 975 To calculate a capital gain or a capital loss, you take ending value minus beginning value, in this case $25 capital gain. So our total dollar return is $85. Hopefully this is relatively straightforward, but what type of total dollar return did you get on your investment when you bought this bond for $950? Um, you received two $30 coupons plus the difference in the value of the security an increase of $25 in this example. Now, it is generally more intuitive to think in terms of percentages uh, rather than dollar returns, so that's what we'll be calculating now. So what would be the percentage return on uh, a particular investment? Now, percentage return can also be broken down into two different types. The first type is what is called a dividend yield, which is that income amount that we calculate, calculated previously divided by the beginning price. It's called a dividend yield, but it can be applied to any type of cash flow that you're receiving. So if you're looking at a bond, it would be simply the coupon amount uh, divided by the beginning price, but it's referred to as the dividend yield. So the uh, income that you receive divided by the beginning price. 
and then you have a capital gains yield. So to calculate a capital gains yield is ending price minus beginning price divided by beginning price. Now your total percentage return then is the sum of those two different yields. You will have some problems that ask you to calculate total percentage return, but also break it down into which uh, what amount is the dividend yield and what amount is the capital gains yield. So be familiar with the two different types of yields. So let's do an example. We buy a stock for $35. We received a dividend of $1.25. The stock is now selling for $40. The first thing that they want to do in this particular scenario is what is the dollar return? So think back to our equation. The dollar return is equal to the income that you've earned plus any capital gain or capital loss. In this case, the income that we received is the top $1.25 dividend. And then the stock is gone from $35 up to $40. So ending price minus beginning price gives us a total dollar return of $6.25. Now let's calculate this as a percentage return. So the first portion is the dividend yield, which as I mentioned is the income divided by the beginning price. So $1.25 divided by $35 gives me 3.57% 3, 3 yield. And then the capital gains yield is ending price minus beginning price divided by beginning price. Our capital gains yield is 14.29%. And so uh, adding those two yields together will give you your total percentage return, which is 17.86%. You can also calculate this total percentage return simply being the total dollar return from part A, $6.25 divided by the beginning price of $35, and you would get this same total percentage return on this scenario. Now, this is a nominal yield, so this is a yield that has not been adjusted for inflation. So previously, we've discussed real rates versus nominal rates, so do understand that this is simply a percentage change in the number of dollars that you have, um, not in incorporating any inflation, so not incorporating the purchasing power of those dollars. So the importance of, fi of financial markets. Financial markets allow companies, governments, and individuals to increase their utility. What does this mean? Well, for savers, they have the ability to invest in financial assets so that they can defer consumption and earn a return to compensate them uh, doing so. So as a saver, you're not utilizing your funds, so you can go ahead and invest in different types of securities such as stocks and bonds. So financial markets provide you this means of being able to do this. And then borrowers, so your corporations, your government entities, they have better access to, uh, to the capital that is available from these savers so that they can then invest in those productive assets which generate cash flows for their, uh, for their companies. So these financial markets are a means of bringing together the buyers and the savers, so the borrowers and the savers. Um, and so the importance of these financial markets is, is being able to increase the utility of these different types of uh, savers and borrowers. Now, financial markets also provide us with information about returns that are required for various levels of risk. So now what we'll turn our discussion to is looking at these returns um, and risk levels of these different types of securities that are traded on these financial markets. We are going to focus on five important types of financial investments. The first is large company stocks. So these can also be referred to as large cap Stocks And this portfolio that we're evaluating here is based on the S&P 500 index, which contains 500 of the largest companies in terms of total market value of outstanding stock in the United States. Now, large cap stocks will have a market cap of greater than $10 billion. And this is our first uh, type of security that we are evaluating in this particular chapter. The second type are small company stocks. So this portfolio is composed of the stock corresponding to the smallest 20% of the companies listed on the New York Stock Exchange in terms of total market value of their outstanding stock. And these are also referred to as small cap stocks. And for this scenario, the small cap stocks have a market capitalization between $300 million and $2 billion. We will also be looking at long-term corporate bonds. So these are based on high-quality bonds with 20 years until maturity. Remember from our bond discussion that high-quality bonds are your investment-grade bonds. So triple B and up uh, bonds are what are included in this long-term corporate bonds category. The next category are long-term government bonds, so based on U.S. government bonds with 20 years to maturity. And last are U.S. Treasury bills. In particular, we are focusing on Treasury bills with a one-month maturity. So these are the five different categories that we will be evaluating here in this chapter. Obviously, there's a lot of other types of financial investments, but we have broken down our analysis into these five categories. And what we'll do next is look at the difference, uh, the different returns and risk levels of these uh, securities 
um, over about an 80, uh, 88-year time period. So here, let's look at a $1 investment in these five different types of uh, portfolios over an 88-year period from 1925 to 2013. As you can see here, uh, small company stocks, a $1 investment would have grown to $33,214.15. Large company stocks, a $1 investment over the 88 years would have grown to $6,029.16. And you can see the other ones. So you may ask the question, why doesn't everyone just invest in small company stocks then? They have the greatest return. Well, they also have the greatest risk. And we'll showcase that here more, but just looking at this chart visually, if you would have invested just in small company stocks for this time period here of about 1967 to 1975, you can see that you would have actually lost value in your investment. Whereas with long-term government bonds, you would have actually had an increase in the value of your investment. So why doesn't everyone just invest in small cap stocks? Well, they do have erratic growth, and you may prefer more steady growth depending on your investment uh, desires. Looking at the average returns over this 88-year period, you can see the average return for large company stocks has been 12%, 16.6% for small company stocks, 6.3% for long-term corporate bonds, and so forth. This is a year-over-year -year average. This is what is called an arithmetic average. So they're adding up each of the years and dividing. They're adding up each of the year's returns and dividing by the number of years. Uh, we'll discuss what an arithmetic average is here uh, upcoming in this uh, presentation. But this is an average return over this 88-year period of those five different categories of investments. Next, we will introduce a risk premium. So the risk premium is the extra return earned for taking on some amount of risk. We say that treasury bills are considered to be risk-free investments. Why are treasury bills considered to be risk-free investments? Well, they are, are federal government securities of one month. Uh, the thought is that the federal government will always be able to repay their balances or make their interest obligations. Um, at a minimum, we would expect them to be able to raise taxes to pay off their debts. So we consider treasury bills, those one-month securities, to be risk-free investments. Now, the risk premium, then, is the excess return required from an investment in a risky asset, such as a large-cap stock or a small-cap stock, over that required from a risk-free investment. So the return on that security, we'll call that security A here, minus whatever that risk-free rate, that is the definition of a risk premium. So looking at the average risk premium over this 88-year period of our five different types of investments, you can see here that large company stocks have a risk premium of 8.6. To get this, what they did was they took the average return of 12% and then subtracted the average return on the risk-free investment, which was 3.4% on treasury bills, to get the risk premium. And they did the same thing for each of these to calculate the risk premium for these different types of investments. As you can see, the risk premium for treasury bills is zero since that is what is being utilized or analyzed as the risk-free rate. And the definition of a risk premium is the excess return uh, above that risk-free investment. Looking at a frequency distribution of returns for large company stocks, what they've done is they've placed the year and the return within the appropriate uh, percentage here on this, on this histogram. Um, you can see the majority of the returns have occurred between uh, 10 and 20 percent. The, the, the majority or the highest number of years of returns have, uh, have occurred during this time frame uh, or during this 10 to 20 percent period or 10 to 20 percent uh, range. They had the, the highest number of years and then they just listed all of these uh, on this chart here for this frequency distribution and we will come back to these charts here um, upcoming. So what we will next do is turn our discussion towards variability of the returns. So riskiness and the variable, variable, variability. So as I mentioned, the more risk you take, the higher the return. What we're, looking, what we're looking at here is how do I identify the riskiness of these investments, and then we'll correlate it with the actual returns of the different investments. So variance and standard deviation measure the volatility of these returns. So this is how we will measure the, the volatility of each of these different returns. Um, the greater the volatility, the greater the uncertainty, the greater the uncertainty, the greater the risk. Now, variance, variance is the average squared difference between the actual return and the average return. Its calculation for historical variance, is, and that's what we'll be covering here since we are using historical data. Uh, you'll notice in the next chapter, chapter 13, we calculate a different type of variance, population variance. 
Uh, so with historical variance, you take the sum of the squared deviations from the mean, the average, and you, and you divide it by n minus 1, the number of observations minus 1. This will give you the historical variance since we are squaring the deviations, so squaring the differences from the average. We do not have a unit with the variance. And then to take the square root of this will give us the standard deviation, which is listed as a percentage since we are using percent returns in our, uh, in our analysis. So this is how we will be measuring variance or uh, measuring volatility and riskiness is by calculating variance and standard deviation. Looking at an example here, the uh, so basically what we have here is a scenario where we have a four period investment, and our returns over these four years were fifteen percent, nine percent, six percent, and twelve percent. When you are calculating variance, the first thing you do is you find the average. So what we've done here is we've taken the, the total of the returns, divided it by 4, and our average return here is 10.5%. So take the total of the returns, divide by 4, you get an average of 10.5%. So this is your average return per year. So here in our next column, we have our average return each period. The deviation from the mean is going to be the actual return that period minus the average return, and in this case, the difference in this first year was 4.5%. In the second year, we took 9% minus 10.5%. We actually performed under the average by 1.5%. In the third year, we performed under the average by 4.5%, and in year four, we performed above the average by 1.5%. So these are your deviations from the mean. Variance is the sum of the squared deviations, so take these values and square them, and we get our squared deviations, add these all together, and we have the sum of our squared deviations from the mean. Now, to calculate historical variance, you take this value, the sum of the squared deviations from the mean, 0 0.0045, and you divide it by n minus 1. N was 4 since there's 4 years of, of, of data. Minus 1 gives us a variance of 0 0.0015. Taking the square root of that gives us a standard deviation of 0 0.03873. And this is listed in the same units as what our inputs were. Here it is percents. So 15%, 9%, 6%, 12% return each of the 4 years. So our standard deviation is 3.87%. Now let's take a look at another example where the entire chart is not filled out in advance. So here, suppose Stefan Diggs had returns of 21%, negative 12%, 4%, and 31% over the past four years. What is the standard deviation of Stefan Diggs' return for the past four years? The first thing you do is find the average. To find the average, we are finding the arithmetic average, a simple average, which tells you to take the sum of your inputs, so 21%, negative 12%, 4%, and 31%. Take the sum of those, divide by the number of years, and here we get a simple average of 11%. Now you could do this without the table, but I will be consistent with the previous slide, and we'll do a table where we will first uh, identify what is our difference from the average each year, square that difference, and then we'll calculate the variance by taking the sum of those squared deviations and uh, dividing it by n minus 1. So here we have year 1, 2, 3, and 4. In year 1, we had a return of 21%. Um, year 2, we had a return of negative 12%. In year 3, we had a return of 4%. And in year 4, we had a return of 31%. The average return each year was 11%. So this is the uh, annual return. This is the average return, which we just calculated. Now the difference here would be 10%. This one would be negative 12 minus, uh, we're, what we're doing here is we're subtracting the average from each of these. So negative 12% minus 1% is a negative 23% difference from that year in the average. 4% uh, minus 11% gives us a negative 7%. And then in year four, that would be a 20% above average performance in that particular year. So these, this value or this column here, if you're creating the columns for your calculations, this column should add up to zero because this, this is the deviations from the mean. Uh, we use those inputs as our average to calculate the average, so the, the sum of these differences should be equal to zero. And so then to calculate variance, it is the sum of the squared 
deviations from the mean. So take that 0.1 and square it and you get 0 0.01. Take that negative 0.23 and square it, you get 0 0.0529. Take the 0 0.07 negative and square it, you get 0 0.04. And then take the, or 0 0.0049, sorry, got a step ahead of myself. And then take that 0.2 and square it and you get 0 0.04. And so the sum of the square deviations from the mean the sum is just simply adding them together. The sum of the square deviations from the mean is 0 0.1078. And you can see that I've taken this difference, and just to be clear here, I've taken this difference. I prefer always working with decimals as opposed to percentages. So I took 0.1 and squared it. I took negative 0.23 and squared it. I took negative 0 0.07 and squared it. I took 0.2 and squared it. That's how I got my square deviations. I get the sum of the square deviations from the mean, and so the variance then is this sum of the square deviations from the mean divided by n minus 1, and in this case our n is 4, 4 years of data, so 4 minus 1 will give us a variance of 0 0.0359. The standard deviation then is the square root of your variance, which gives us a value of 0.18. 96 or 18.96%. And this will come into play uh, later on in our discussion when we talk about how we can use this uh, standard deviation to, um, to assess normal distribution and, and probabilities of, of particular outcomes. Now, one thing that I forgot to mention uh, with variance, this is notated by sigma squared, and standard deviation is notated by sigma. Uh, so you may see those, no, uh, those notations as opposed to variance and standard deviation written out, but these are the uh, notations for variance and standard deviation, respectively. Now, as these values become higher, that means more volatility, more risk, you should expect a higher return based on this risk-return trade-off. Now, continuing on, why this uh, variance and standard deviation, again, is also important uh, let's look at the historical returns, the standard deviation, and the frequency distributions over these securities from 1926 to 2016. So now we're dealing with 90 years of data. And just looking at these, as we mentioned at the very beginning, we have a risk-return trade-off. The greater the risk, the higher the return. The greater the risk, the higher the return. Um, so as you can see here, as your standard deviation, our measure of risk, as it increases, that is where we get our higher returns. Those that have less volatility, less standard deviation, those are the ones with the smaller returns uh, with this risk-return trade-off here. So continuing on with an introduction into normal distribution, so the normal distribution is useful for describing the probability of ending in a given range. So what is normal distribution? Normal distribution is a symmetric bell-shaped frequency distribution. So as you place these in this, uh, in this frequency chart, the pre and we'll come back to it here in a second, as you, as you place these data or these individual data points in a frequency chart, your data comes out to look like a bell. Uh, it's a bell-shaped distribution. Um, so you may have heard someone say that they are grading on a curve. That is where you have your average there in the middle, and you have a, an even number on both sides, a, a relatively even number on both sides of the average. Um, what's nice about normal distribution is that it is completely defined. So you can create a normal distribution or a bell chart uh, with, only two po with only two data points, being the mean and the standard deviation, so the average and the volatility. So let's look back at the frequency distributions on the previous slide, and what we'll notice is that these returns appear to at least roughly be at least roughly normally distributed. So looking back at the previous slide, you can see that their frequency distributions all have this bell shape curve, right? So this is what normal distribution is. It is completely defined by the average, which would fall here in the middle, and the standard deviation of the, of the return, so the volatility of the returns. Now, why is this important? Well, if you have normal distribution, you can uh, find the probability of your return based on this bell-shaped curve. So in the middle of your curve is this average. So in this case, our average, uh, we're looking at large company stocks. The average return over this time period that was being analyzed, uh, the 100 years, was 12.1%. 68% of your data will fall plus or minus one standard deviation from the mean. So in this case, there is a standard deviation. Uh, if you go back to the previous slide, the standard deviation for large company stocks 
they actually are using, this is from to 2016, let's go back to the 2013 data, so the 88 year time period. Uh, here the standard deviation is 20.2%, I'm just giving this to you here, but you can, uh, you can predict the probability uh, being within some range at 68%, uh, being this average of 12.1%. This average of 12.1% plus or minus one standard deviation. So if I take 12.1% and subtract one standard deviation, I will get negative 8.1. And if I take 12.1% and add one standard deviation, I will get 32.3. And so the probability of a return being between negative 8.1% and 32.3% is 68%. Now if we expand it, 95% of the data falls plus or minus two standard deviations. So take the average, add two deviations, take the average, subtract two deviations, you can get a range that 95% of the data falls between negative 28.3% and 52.5%, and then 99% of the data falls within plus or minus three standard deviations. So if you have normal uh, distribution, you can predict the probability of a return falling within some range based on first calculating what the average return is, then calculating what the standard deviation is, and understanding that 68% of the data falls plus or minus one standard deviation of the mean, 95% uh, of the data falls plus or minus two standard deviations from the mean, and then 99% of the data falls plus or minus three standard deviations from the mean. So I keep saying uh, deviations from the mean. So far what we've done is we've calculated mean by just adding up the individual inputs and dividing by the number of inputs. There is actually another way in which you can calculate an average. Uh, and before we get to that, just a re, uh, refresher. Uh, so the probability that you will end up within one standard deviation is about two-thirds, so 68%. And uh, probability within two standard deviations is 95% and then 99% um, for plus or minus three standard deviations. So uh, real quick, just to give you an idea as to, uh, as to market volatility, um, in 2008, uh, it was one of the worst years for stock market investors in history. So the S&P 500 actually plunged 37%, and the index lost 17% in October alone. And then from March 2009 to uh, February 11th, the S&P actually doubled in value, um, and long-term treasury bonds actually gained over 40% in 2008 and then lost 26% in 2009. So as you are investing in these different types of securities, it is important to understand that you are taking on risk and you should be compensated for the risk that you take on, but there is a lot of volatility in financial markets. So now getting back to this average calculation. So there's two different ways in which you could calculate average. Uh, you can calculate an arithmetic average or you can calculate a geometric average. To calculate the arithmetic average, this is the average you are most familiar with. Um, you would take it, it is defined as the return earned in an average period over multiple uh, periods. So you add up each year's return and divide by the number of returns you have. Um, so unless it's stated otherwise, this is the average return that they provide you with. And this will tell you what you earned in a typical year over that time frame that you're evaluating. Now, on the other hand, we have a geometric average. The geometric average is the average compound returned uh, return per period over multiple periods. And to solve for it, you take 1 plus the decimal version of the return each period, and you multiply it by 1 plus the rate of return for the next period, and you do so all the way throughout. Um, and then you raise it to the 1 over t power, where t is the number of, comp or where t is the number of inputs, and then you subtract 1. So with this geometric average, this tells you what you actually earned per year, year over year, when you are compounding annually. So when we've been solving for the IY in our previous calculations, uh, this is what you're solving for when you're solving for that IY, the compound uh, year over year rate. Um, now, when you are dealing with arithmetic versus geometric averages, uh, since the geometric average is a compound rate of return, the geometric average will always be less than the arithmetic average unless all the returns are equal. So if you had the same returns each period, uh, then the arithmetic and the geometric average would be the same. If the returns fluctuate at all, the geometric average will always be slightly lower because this is the compound uh, rate of return that you will earn uh, over this particular investment time frame. So let's take a look at an example here. What is the arithmetic and the geometric average for the following returns? Well, arithmetic is the one that you're most familiar with. You just take each year, in this case 5%, plus a negative 3%, plus 12%, 
and divide by the number of years. So in this case, our arithmetic average is 4.67%. And then to calculate the geometric, this is the one that is the compound growth rate. So what you do is you take 1 plus the rate as a decimal times 1 plus the rate as a decimal. So in this case, negative 3% times 1 plus the rate as a decimal. You take this product, you raise it to the 1 over t power. t is 3 in this case. And then you subtract 1, and we get a value of 0 0.0449 or 4.49%. Notice that the geometric average is slightly lower than the arithmetic because that is the compound growth rate, uh, taking into consideration the compounding uh, year over year. Sorry, I have the, cal the uh, equations there in the PowerPoint for those of you that would like to reference that there. So we will finish our discussion here talking about efficient capital markets. So this is a deep look into efficient, not a deep look, but a discussion into efficient capital markets. What are they? So an efficient capital market is a market in which the security prices reflect available information. Uh, with this efficient market, stock prices are in equilibrium or they are fairly priced. Um, so basically what this is saying is that uh, you will, or when you invest in a security in a, that, that is being traded in an efficient capital market, you should earn a return that is appropriate for the amount of risk that's being taken. So if this is true, then you should not be able to earn an abnormal or an excess return uh, based on the risk level of, of your particular investment. Now, efficient markets do not imply that investors cannot earn a positive return in the stock market. It simply means that you should be compensated uh, based on the level of risk that you're taking on your investment. So looking at an efficient capital market here, there, this is just a chart showcasing a company stock which is trading for $140. They're getting ready to announce some new uh, information. And when that announcement is made, the stock price immediately jumps to reflect that new information. Uh, if you had an, uh, a delayed reaction or an overreaction or a correction uh, here, you can see that it takes multiple days before it gets back to its true value. But if you have an efficient capital market, then the price should automatically uh, reflect the available information on that particular security. Now, what makes markets efficient? Efficient? Well, there are many investors out there doing research. Um, as new information comes to the market, this information is analyzed and then trades are made based on this information. Uh, and so, therefore, prices should reflect all available public information. It takes milliseconds for new information to be incorporated um, into a securities price. Um, as these new investors are doing their research and trying to identify these uh, buy or sell uh, investments, any new information that comes out about the company should be reflected in that company's uh, valuation. Now, if investors stopped researching these stocks, then the market would not be efficient, um, but it is due to these investors pr uh, putting, into, or putting forth this, this type of um, research that results in the efficiency uh, results in these prices being efficiently priced. Some common misconceptions about the efficient market hypothesis. Well, what is the efficient market hypothesis? This is the hypothesis that actual capital markets, such as the New York Stock Exchange, are indeed efficient. So there's no arbitrage opportunities. Arbitrage is a risk-free um, return, so you're not able to earn a return without taking risk due to mispricing of securities. Now, as I mentioned previously, efficient markets do not mean that you cannot make money. It just simply means that on average, you will earn a return that is appropriate for the risk undertaken, and there is not a bias in prices that can be exploited to earn excess returns. So if you think back to our five different types of investments, you should be compensated greater to take a risk on large or on small cap stocks since there's more volatility, more risk measured by standard deviation than you should for government bonds, for example, less risk less return. This goes back to our risk return trade-off, where if you have efficient capital markets, you should earn a return that is appropriate for the amount of risk that you're taking on that particular investment. So market efficiency will still not protect you from wrong choices. If you do not diversify, you still don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. So think back to that chart of the returns of $1 over an 88-year time period. I showcase that for about a 10-year period, um, small cap stocks actually decreased in value, whereas large uh, or government bonds actually increased in value. You can offset some of the losses of one investment security with uh, investments in other securities uh, by diversifying your portfolio. You don't want to put all your investments into one type of security. You end up putting yourself at risk that you could otherwise diversify away.
So we'll conclude here with different forms of market efficiency. So there are three main forms of market efficiency based on the amount of information that is included. Now there's a lot of, of, of studies discussing how efficient they, that, that uh, researchers believe the financial markets are. Uh, let's talk about the three different types of market efficiency that are most often argued. So the first type is strong form efficiency. With strong form efficient market, if you had a strong form efficient market, prices reflect all information, including public and private. There's not much, inf- there's not much study arguing that the U.S. capital markets are strong form efficient, as we've seen, pre- as we've probably all heard uh, of investors uh, getting caught trading on, on, on inside information and earning an abnormal return on that information, if it were a strong form efficient market, then the prices would reflect, reflect all that information, public and private. So we know that that's not how the U.S. markets are. Uh, so the U.S. markets are definitely not strong form efficient, uh, but that is one type of, of market efficiency. Um, as I mentioned here, if the market is strong form efficient, then investors could not earn abnormal, and abnormal just means uh, a return that is not that is greater than the risk level that you're taking uh, could not earn an abnormal return regardless of the information they possessed. Second type of form, the one that is most commonly argued for the capital markets in the United States, is a semi-strong form efficiency. This is where your security prices reflect all publicly available information, including trading information, annual reports, press releases, etc. Um, if the market is semi-strong, form efficient, then investors cannot earn abnormal returns by trading on public information because that public information is already included in the uh, in the pricing of that security. So as soon as that new information becomes public, researchers utilize that information to um, adjust their buy and sell prices on these different securities and the prices almost instantaneously um, incorporate that new information. And then the last form is a weak form efficient market, which states that prices reflect all past market information, such as price and volume. And so if the market is weak form efficient, then investors cannot earn abnormal returns by trading on market information. So this is using technical analysis and looking at, um, looking at charts and looking at previous information about a, diff- about a security and trying to predict what the upcoming price would be based on this uh, past information. So to conclude, we will look at a quick quiz. Uh, which of the following invest or which of the investments that we discuss has had the highest average return and risk premium? This would have been your small cap stocks. So the highest average return, but also the most risk above the risk free investment would, was your small cap stocks. And then which of the investments discussed had the highest standard deviation? Once again, small cap stocks, higher risk measured by standard deviation, higher return, that risk return trade off. What is capital market efficiency? Uh, capital market efficiency is that security prices are accurately priced based on available information. And then what are the three forms of market efficiency? You have strong form, semi-strong form, and weak form. Uh, Depending on the form would be uh, the argument of how much information goes into the pricing of a security. And so wrapping up with one last comprehensive problem, let's say your stock investment returns over a three-year period are 8%, 12%, and negative 4%. What is the geometric return? Well, we know the arithmetic return is just add the three up and divide by, by three. The geometric return says you take one plus that rate of return multiplied by 1 plus the next next rate of return, multiplied by 1 plus the next rate of return, we take that product, we raise it to the 1 over t power, which in this case is 3, 3 years of returns, and then we subtract 1, we get a geometric average of 0.0511 or 5.11%. Now they want us to calculate what is the sample standard deviation of the above returns. When you are calculating standard deviation, you use the arithmetic average. So the first thing is to calculate the mean. The mean would be simply 8% plus 12% plus a negative 4%. Take that sum, divide by the number of inputs, we get a mean of 0.055. Notice that this is slightly higher than the geometric average, just like we discussed previously. The geometric average will always be slightly less, that is the compound rate of return, than what your arithmetic is. Now to calculate the variance, previously I made that chart that showcased each year's return, what the average return is, what was the difference, and then what was the uh, squared difference, added those up and then divided by n minus 1. I'm going to simplify things here a little bit. So variance by definition, just hear out the definition, uh, is the sum, so the adding, 
of the squared deviations from the mean. So we take the year one return, how much did it deviate from the average, and we square that deviation, and we do that for each year. So take the second year's return, how much did it deviate from the average, square that return. Take the third year's return, negative 4%, how much did it deviate from the average, and square that return. So the sum of the squared deviations from the mean divided by n minus 1. So n minus 1, n is 3 years of returns, minus 1. We get a variance of 0 0.00693. Once again, this can be notated as sigma squared. The standard deviation then, represented by sigma, is simply the square root of this value. So we get a standard deviation of 0 0.08. 33 or 8.33%. Now using this standard deviation and mean and assuming normal probability distribution, what is the probability of losing 3% or more? So if we have normal distribution, we have this bell-shaped curve completely defined by the mean, the average, and standard deviation. Here in the center is the average. Our average return was 5.33%. Normal distribution says that 68% of, of the data will fall plus or minus one standard deviation of the mean. So take that average, add one standard deviation that we just calculated. And so the upper bound of our 68% uh, probability range would be 13.66%. Take our average, subtract one standard deviation. And the lower bound of our mean is negative 3%. And so what this showcases is that if we have normal distribution, 68% of our data will fall between negative 3% and 13.66%, meaning that we have 16% that falls above this amount and 16% that falls below this amount, 100% total data there in our entire uh, normal distribution. They want to know what is the probability of losing 3% or more this would be below this lower bound of the 68% range of one plus or minus one standard deviation from the average. So what would be the probability? The probability would be 16%, this lower portion that is below 3%. So that concludes our uh, lecture video here for Chapter 12, uh, looking at some capital market history and the returns that we could earn on financial securities and the riskiness of those securities. And then if we can apply those returns on the financial assets to non-financial assets, such as a capital budgeting project, this is a way that you can get that required rate of return that you would use as your uh, discount rate when valuing these future cash flows. So good luck. Um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out, and I will talk to you all soon. Thanks. Bye.